Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Jensen. Do you remember our full title for this session? If you, it's about AI and Earth observation, so that's if you're here for that, you're in the right room. Um, we've got a couple uh, great speakers. I think we're at five speakers today that are going to cover a breadth of uh, AI topics um, from different. I don't think we have anyone from uh, the same agency, so you'll hear a nice variety of. Uh, of content today. Uh, but I don't need to talk for too long, so I guess we'll just bring up Raul to kick things off. Yeah, I didn't know the exact time. So, uh, can you guys hear me at the back? Yeah. So, I'm Rahul Ramachandran, I'm from NASA Marshall. I manage a project called Impact. Um, and this is a fairly high level uh, presentation about machine learning applications uh, for earth science data discovery. It's more talking about the machine learning portfolio that we are working on within the Impact project. Um, so I don't know if anybody even read the description of the session. I think this is what caught my eye, this uh, line that sooner or later, the fire of AI will burn Earth science field. <laughs> so anyway, the, the description worked. It got, it got my attention and I asked Annie if I could present it. Uh, the, the outline of my talk, I'll give a, a quick background on the impact project, uh, uh, brief overview of ML. I assuming most of you know what it is. But if you don't, I'll give a high level view of that. I'll talk a little bit about machine learning landscape in earth science. We've done some literature analysis to see where machine learning is going in within earth science, uh, mm -hmm. look at challenges and opportunities of machine learning, and then a roadmap that we think, uh, at least from data system, systems perspective. And then our approach to machine learning, like how do we tackle machine learning problems and some of the applications that we're working on. So that's the outline of my uh, uh, presentation. So uh, most of us know this, you know, now we are moving to this, or we are at the stage of uh, data intensive science where, you know, the uh, data can drive uh, new knowledge, right? This is the, the new paradigm that uh, 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 Jim Graham uh, uh, wrote about in 2007. So this is the context of what's driving science in this whole big data environment now. Um, so just briefly, you know, Impact is funded by the Earth Science Data System Program. The program is tasked to actively manage all NASA's assets, uh, data coming from different assets, whether it's satellite, airborne, or field. The, the program uses a very systematic engineered process of data stewardship. It has multiple steps that go through from mission formulation to product generation, to ingest archive, to distribution. Uh, and each step is an iterative process. There are different steps you have to go through to do this active data stewardship. With the ultimate goal for the program being to maximize return on the NASA data sets, these high value uh, data sets that we have. So in addition to the data stewardship process itself, the program has a data system, which basically supports the data life cycle. And and with combination of the data stewardship process and the data system supports research that the community does using our data sets, right? So you can, all the data systems that we provide support this whole research life cycle. Uh, it's all tied together. Um, so impact was formulated to look at three aspects. Uh, one of them was, you know, looking, uh, fostering innovation within the program, within our systems, processes, the second one is trying to build strategic connections. This is with other federal agencies, other organizations, uh, a lot of public-private partnership. We are we have uh, space factor agreements with Amazon and Google, and one of the focus is machine learning with uh, you know utilizing their expertise uh, on our data sets. And then the third component is this whole early technology adoption. Like, can we be more proactive about technology changes rather than being reactive about you know what what's happening within the technology area so the work that i'm going to talk about the machine learning work falls under this whole notion of new technology development so i'll talk about our portfolio within that 
Um, um, people who have worked on machine learning know this. You know, you cannot, if you want to work on large problems, machine learning problems, you cannot work on it alone. You need a right skill mix. Unless you are one in the middle to the unicorn, it's really hard for you to tackle complex problems on your own. You need math statistics, you need computer science, and you need subject matter expertise. So where we tackle the problem is we try to uh, have a team which has the right skill mix of the right people who can work together on these problems. Um, we focus on the machine learning, specifically the deep learning aspect of uh, you know, uh, applications. Uh, we are not uh, tackling any of the artificial intelligence, the broader knowledge representation ontology aspect. Um, so just a quick ML 101, um, you all know this, you know, you have data. Uh, what the machine learning is trying to do is uh, basically come up with a function that will do a prediction or a classification for you, right? That is ultimately what the data is trying to build, the algorithm is trying to build this function using the data that you have. So the two examples on the right hand side are standard, I think, training data you get from scikit-learn to blobs. So the function that it will learn is a straight line that demarcates the, the two clusters. In the case of the second chart there, will be a circle that separates the two, uh, the two uh, classes. So that is, at a conceptual level, what machine learning is trying to do. Take your data, come up with a decision boundary that can separate out the classes or a prediction that you're trying to make. Of course, the actual application is far, far more complicated than this. Uh, you have to go through multiple stages of, uh, of iterations. The hardest part for most people is pre-processing. Actually, the hardest part is finding the right data. Uh, and then you go into pre-processing the data uh, preparing the data for actually doing your machine learning, looking at the candidate model, looking at the scores, and iterating back. And this diagram is also incorrect. Actually, there is a loop that once you even deploy the model, then you realize in real world the model doesn't work, and you have to go back and reiterate it. It's something that we've learned the hard way. Um, from deep learning perspective, this is a high-level view of what a deep learning uh, deep learning Looks like I think some of the things were mentioned in Paco's talk in the in the plenary where he talked about you know the advances that have happened in deep learning, where they've you know the problems that plague neural networks earlier, this whole gradient uh, van vanishing gradient problem, all those things have been solved. You know, availability of cheap computing has basically driven this whole field of deep learning. So what um, the network does is, you know, you as a simple example, you give it a problem for identifying people. At each level of the neural network, it is learning a different, a, a different uh, uh, characteristics of the, the target that you're giving it. At the lower level, it's learning primitive characteristics. That are, as you go down deeper into the network, it's starting to learn more complex features, and and then it puts it together into the final st stage of identifying the, the, uh, the person from this image. Um, the other nice thing about using a deep, uh, not deep learning, but convolution neural network is uh, it does, you don't have to do feature engineering, which is a hard task that we normally face, where you really need a domain expertise to understand which particular feature to use or to give to your classifier, whether it's the right band or certain manipulation to the data that you need to do. So that's one of the advantages of using convolution neural network. Um, so this is kind of a high level overview of what deep learning does, the level of abstractness, where it goes, learns the primitive features at the, low, at the starting layers, and as, as you go deeper, it's learning more and more complex features from the data. So, you know, we, there's a couple of, uh, Papers, review papers came out recently that talked about, you know, uh, machine learning within earth science, and they talked about different challenges that are uh, that are still present in applying machine learning effectively within earth science. Um, you know, they listed challenges like understanding the model. You know, it's a black box. You know, how do you understand what the model has learned? And then they also listed a lot of other uh, uh, data-related uh, 
challenges. One of them was, you know, a lack of training data. There's very few training data that is available that people can use to benchmark test algorithms. There are no benchmark training data sets that people can use to test and evaluate different types of algorithms. And then obviously the heterogeneity of the data itself, which we all know in earth science, you can't get, away, get around it. But we were really intrigued by the, uh, the, the review papers and we wanted to see how has, you know, how well has machine learning as a tool been adopted within earth science. And we started to do a review of literature and we looked at uh, journals uh, from AGU, AMS, IEEE, and SPIE to look at the trends for last 10 years and you can see a dramatic increase on machine learning uh, within these journals. Um, if you remove linear regression, which turns out to be one of the most common approaches that people use uh, within their uh, um, uh, analysis, it, the trend is still the same. It's a remarkable, remarkable increase in terms of uh, 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 machine learning techniques being used in uh, scientific research. Uh, this is, let's see, can play. So the movie doesn't work. Oh. So anyway, uh, this is looking at keywords from AGU for last 10 years. And what is really interesting is climate change for last 10 years is the most common keyword in all the journals, all the articles submitted to AGU. But you see machine learning come up in the last two years as the se second most common keyword. So there is a, a, a large adoption of these approaches within our science that we are seeing. Um, we try to look at by journal just to understand because earth science is such a broad area. We want to see within certain areas, are we seeing differences like certain areas are adopting machine learning more than the others? It, and it turns out that yes, there are certain areas, atmosphere, you know, biogeochemical uh, processes, some areas are, are actually using machine learning more heavily than the other, uh, especially if you do it by person. You can see, you know, some of these areas, more than 20%, of the journal papers are using machine learning. So this is becoming a common tool that is used by researchers. It has implications to people who produce data, how we produce data, what kind of services we provide, because this is going to probably be the norm going down the road. Um, so this is the other thing that we were interested, what is the size of the training data? And if you look at it, the training data are really, really small. Um, you know, it's, uh, most of them are around hundreds and thousands of uh, data uh, uh, training sizes. So people who are working on deep learning know, know that this is a major problem. I mean, if we want deep learning specifically to be, uh, you know, widely adopted within our domain, we really need to uh, tackle this and provide more large uh, training data sets that, you know, people who are developing and uh, developing algorithms or applying algorithms can utilize this effectively. So, so why machine learning for earth science? Uh, data systems, we're looking at data systems. Obviously, the first one we already know that there are opportunities to do novel research and applications. You know, we've seen that some of these models can outperform the traditional ways of uh, doing analysis. But I think there is, um, you know, an opportunity here that we can now exploit large archives of earth science data, specifically now that, you know, you see different federal agencies are moving towards the cloud, the data is gonna be co-located with the compute and you have now access and ability to do things with this data set. So there's an opportunity there. Um, the other area that is, tends to be uh, ignored is can we augment and improve data system operations using machine learning, right? Can we, it is good that we wanna focus on a really new game-changing ap uh, application, but I think the power of machine learning and deep learning could be applied on some of the low hanging fruits that we can automate some of our processes, do simpler stuff first, which can be a major improvement overall. So challenges, I mentioned this earlier, there is a training uh, data issue. Uh, we, NASA is sponsoring a workshop uh, end of this month that is looking at this, like how do we tackle this training data issue. Um, the lack of benchmark data sets, and maybe this is something ESIP can do, is basically put together benchmark data sets and have 
people come and test their algorithms or build new algorithms against it. Uh, the data complexity is always there. I mean, it's part of our domain. We cannot get around it. Um, the, the other challenge is it's, you know, when you're trying to tackle complex problems, you really need to take a team science approach. You cannot do it as one single PI trying to, uh, you know, be an expert in machine learning, the domain itself, and then trying to scale it out. I think it's probably better to partner with the right people with the right skills so that you can actually tackle the problem yeah, with, uh, with, with the expertise in, uh, in, within your team. And that's what we try to use in our approach. So from our perspective, there are six focus areas that we would like to work on. Um, one of them is this whole uh, training data scarcity and the workshop is, uh, uh, is trying to address that bit. I think the community building is important. We are looking at strategic partnerships. I think at least from the machine learning AI, I think the private industry is further ahead in some of these areas. We want to have strategic partnership with them in trying to leverage their expertise in tackling some of their problems. Um, I think focusing some of these applications on practical applications, which are low hanging fruit, I think would bear more benefit for us, focusing on operations and uh, applications. And then there are obviously new tools. Uh, we want to have machine learning tools that tie in directly with our data systems so that it's not a uh, disjointed uh, experience for people who are uh, utilizing or developing machine learning algorithms. Um, the, the other aspect is the operational infrastructure. How do you deploy your models into operations in a seamless manner so you can utilize it? Um, so where, what we do with an impact is we do feasibility studies. We look at different ideas uh, and we try to work on uh, them just to see whether they are uh, workable, that they need to be uh, you know, looked into in a little more, bit more detail. And we worked on some, some, uh, some examples and I'll show you some of them. Um, the way we approach it is this approach called ML Canvas. Uh, it's a very systematic way of looking at a machine learning problem I've sat in meetings where people have great ideas, but you know some of them are not practical or feasible. So you, utilizing this canvas approach, I think it, it is borrowed from Lean Sigma 6 uh, approach. It's a really good way of looking at, you know, what is the value proposition? What are we trying to do? Do we have data? Do we have stuff? Okay, oops, sorry. I'm running out of time. Um, I was going to go, let me go through some of the examples very quickly. Uh, this is some of the examples we've worked on. This is uh, estimating hurricane wind speed using uh, uh, satellite imagery, which is gold imagery. Um, we are working on phenomena detection. Uh, this is transfer cirrus fans that is important for aviation. Uh, high latitude dust. The, the goal behind all these detection of the phenomena is that we can actually add them to our existing uh, uh, data visualization tool so that the visualization becomes more dynamic. You can actually look at you know things that are happening within the satellite image at the, in real time. Um, this is image labeler. It ties with our data system so that people can now go tag images. And there's a session tomorrow on labeling, and I'll talk a little bit more about this if you're interested. Uh, come to that session. Um, this is looking at meta metadata. It's not the sexiest thing, but don't uh, dead. I hope it's not here, but um, it's actually trying to figure out can we tag our descriptions with GCMD keywords in a consistent manner? You know, because the one the way it's done manually, you tend to have wide variability in who's tagging it. So there are different applications here. Uh, here's my contact information. I do want to show one last movie. Sorry, Annie. Um, so this is. Everyone recognized this hurricane, right? The one that was supposed to hit Alabama. No. <laughs> so this is actually, um, so the, on the image on the left is the GOES imagery. The image on the right is the Dvorak technique that is used. It's a manual approach of trying to estimate wind speed. The thing in the middle is class activation map. And what it's trying to do is trying to It'll trigger uh, what the network thinks is the most important thing for the classification. And the thing at the bottom, the graph that you're looking at is the uh, forecast wind speed versus what the predicted wind speed is. 
And you'll see that once the, the hurricane gets stronger and it starts forming the shape, gets more cohesive, the class activation map will, will key off on it in the, as, as the hurricane gets stronger. And then when it dissipates, it'll focus on the outer bands. So there are ways to go look at what your model is learning and then you know, decipher whether you know, it's useful or not. So you can kind of see it's actually uh, focused on the eye. And as it dissipates, it will start looking at the, the, uh, the bands around the eye. So that's all I have. So thank you so much. Please uh, find Raul after if you have any questions. I was surprised that water resources research was so high, but I, any hydrologist in the room can tell me where your field is at in terms of using uh, machine learning, because I was a bit surprised by that, but maybe I shouldn't be. All right, uh, Li Ping, can you show me which one is yours? Oh, uh, auto comp. Yeah. Auto. Um, maybe. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Li Ping Di from uh, Judge Mason University. I'm going to talk about uh, some idea uh, for the fully automated uh, unmanned farming. Uh, this is quite a high level, uh, you know, idea concept talking. And uh, I will talk about the, this is some content agriculture and uh, evolution, and the IT revolution and uh, digital agriculture and. Uh, uh, vision for unmanned farming, <clears throat> and uh, we talk about uh, two level of automation, and then uh, talk about the approach for decision making automation, and uh, give a little bit of uh, uh, information about the project that currently uh, we conduct uh, called Water Smart. So uh, every know people know agriculture is uh, the uh, oldest uh, industry in human society. So you know every people relies on agriculture to provide uh, food, uh, fiber, and uh, also energy and uh, lots of other stuff. So this is the the, the impact. Also, you know the uh, agriculture direct directly only contribute one percent of for U.S. Uh, uh, GDP, but uh, they have a fairly broad impact to the entire society. So, and uh, the food and the related industry contribute 5.5 percent of the entire GDP. So they have uh, uh, many different uh, type of agriculture, include the cultivation for crop, uh, you know, and also aquaculture, tree farm farming and the other stuff. And the, for my talk, I only uh, concentrate on the cultivation of uh, crop, crops, so like uh, crop farming. So evolution of agriculture, we start from, you know, uh, man, uh, uh, animal labor, the agriculture is very, very, at, at least 6,000 6, years old. And here, you know, early, uh, uh, early 20 years, uh, Century uh, in U.S. and the late 19th century, early 20th century. In other part of the world, you still, you know, use animal labor, or man labor for the agriculture. But in U.S., most, uh, most of the uh, uh, machine, uh, you know, machinized uh, uh, agriculture. And this is some feature for man, you know, uh, animal labor. The agriculture basically is a labor intensive, small scale, low productivity. But uh, we also have a uh, advantage is it's a very, you know, um, a low environmental foot, footprint and uh, self-sustain. And uh, now we come in U.S. basically, you know, we have a large scale uh, petroleum driven uh, agriculture and we use a uh, lot for art, uh, artificial fertilizing and, uh, you know, pesticide, herbicide and uh, also improve seeds and the key feature is that we have a large scale production, high productivity and uh, also uh, most, uh, you know, farm, uh, uh, you know, produce uh, the, the product not for themselves to consume, 
consume actually is the sale. And the problem is that, you know, we have a sustainability issue, pollution, and also waste of a, a, a resource like over fertilizing, uh, over irrigation. And uh, currently, this, you know, the human society is experienced a uh, uh, significant uh, uh, transformation, basically uh, driven by the information technology. And uh, some most uh, important technology, you know, include uh, AI, machine learning, sen sensor and sensing technology, big data, and the high performance computing. And those technology now has transformed the many industry into a uh, unmanned operation. If you go to like a, a lot like the like a, a car manufacturer and the other you know manufacturer industrial manufacturing, um, a lot for them are now unmanned operation. And so, but uh, however, the IT revolution you know uh, adoption in the agriculture is uh, relatively slow than other part. And so this is uh, our vision for the future of uh, farming. We, we, we believe it's uh, a key revolution will inevitably transform agriculture into a, a fully automated uh, industry. So this means a fully automated uh, unmanned farming. And uh, we expect to see the prototype available in the 2030. Like 10 years later, we, 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 we believe that this, you can see such kind of prototype complete the uh, fully automated um, and uh, if this kind of thing happen you know we'll completely change the agricultural landscape and uh, the production chain and uh, also change the rural community and the economy and uh, so this is what's our, our vision and how we're going to realize such a vision and uh, so it's automation in agriculture or farming we have uh, you know uh, we can um, uh, increase significantly increase the productivity and and reduce the waste and uh, the specific technology as I mentioned that uh, is AI machine learning sensor sensing and uh, positioning sensor web and uh, IoT and big data and the high performance computing. Um, so this is uh, something and uh, how to realize a fully automated farming. I think you know we have a two level for automation. One is the machinery automation, and the one is the decision making of automation. And if we connect these two, you know we have uh, realized fully automated uh, farm. And uh, in the machinery uh, automation, currently you know many companies work on it, and you can see you know automated unmanned uh, uh, tractor combine all those are available and uh, technology develop in other industry like uh, uh, also can be adapted but uh, the, at the decision level automation we still you know see very uh, slow and the research intensive area and the main thing is uh, the, the, the decision making automation we want to replace farms uh, bring with the AI and uh, so we're going to you know make an automate uh, automated decision on farming activity like uh, when and uh, what to plant when and how much to uh, irrigate when to harvest you know when to apply the fertilizing uh, apply pesticides so all those you know farm decision Currently, is totally based on the you know um, uh, farmers' uh, experience and uh, uh, with uh, incomplete uh, information. And so we want to make this automated. So if these two can combine, then we can realize the vision that uh, you know uh, fully automated farm. And uh, so, uh, how we do do the automated decision making, uh, like for the crop. Uh, farming, the decision making for action like irrigation, apply fertilizing, require know the current condition of the crop and its environment. And we also need to know the predicted future condition of the crop and its environment with, uh, with or without uh, action. So, and then we're going to have a op optimizing future condition. This is uh, something we call decision goal through trade off uh, data driven knowledge based uh, reasoning. 
And so for the current, con uh, you know, condition, we have a many different methods to measure the current condition of the crop, like a remote sensing, sensor web, in situ uh, sensors, uh, as is IoT uh, modeling. And uh, those are also used, you know, machine learning can uh, derive the current condition from those uh, data source. And the for future condition mainly based on the modeling uh, and with the current condition and uh, uh, as the input. So we say basically we ha have a physical based model, statistic based model and the also machine learning. And as a decision making stage, you know, we need a current condition, future condition as the input and to make the decision based on the, uh, you know, data driven knowledge based decision. And we have a lot of many you can use a symbolic reasoning, like ontological reasoning, or use machine learning. So those, you know, the technology is uh, uh, already there. Yeah, we need to change, put everything together. And so, the, you know, the geospatial big data is a very important thing because data is uh, essential for such kind of automated farming. And so, you know, this provide the current condition and monitoring future condition prediction. And so I, I next couple of slides, I will talk about uh, uh, an example for automated decision making. We have a project going on funded by National Science Foundation called Smart. And this project is uh, uh, going to, uh, uh, going to uh, you know, uh, do the, automated uh, irrigation decision making uh, based on the geospatial uh, data and the machine learning technology. And we have a team from uh, uh, GMU, uh, Nebraska, uh, Yuka, Inca, and uh, Purdue uh, work on the project. So the area is, uh, we uh, test the area is for entire state of Nebraska and the uh, objective is uh, uh, fully automated, uh, automated uh, uh, irrigation decision making for large uh, geographic area at the uh, field scale. So this means uh, we can tell this farm, farmer, you know, when and how much water should be irrigated for each field. And as the goal is to save 10% uh, of irrigation water and energy. And uh, how we do it is, as I mentioned, as uh, data driven uh, automated irrigation decision. Uh, making and uh, the approach is that uh, uh, the what's uh, we're going to use is a uh, you know current condition future condition prediction uh, for current condition monitoring future condition prediction and the uh, same uh, decision and uh, so this is some fact in Nebraska you know population uh, the people working in the farm is uh, very older actually average is 55 in well, but the most area in Nebraska is uh, irrigated. Is, uh, ir uh, Nebraska, in fact, is uh, uh, one of the largest, uh, uh, the largest irrigated state in, in the U.S. And uh, skip. so this is an example of the irrigation the, in Nebraska, mostly a central pivot irrigation system. Basically, you know, you have a, a sprinkle. Uh, and uh, a wheel in the middle and, uh, you know, uh, irrigate uh, uh, along the ship, the field. And this is a field of view of the irrigation system and this land set of view. Uh, you can see individual uh, circle is a uh, central pivot uh, irrigation system. And uh, so this, the, actually the, the project, you know, we try to do up optimal uh, optimal irrigation the uh, decision making because uh, the, the optimal irrigation decision making basically you know uh, provide uh, uh, water uh, right amount of water at the right, right time uh, and for right uh, location and uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, really you know you you need a lot of scientific data to make sure that uh, you know you're not not over irrigated and uh, if you irrigate it today and uh, you know next couple of days going to have uh, like a big rain this basically you have a waste so we we need a current condition future condition but uh, you know currently the farm don't have such knowledge and the data available so they basically do the 
so-called calendar scheduling. So basically every three, five days, they irrigate the wings. So create a lot of trees. And so we do, what we do, uh, data is a data-driven irrigation decision making. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the project, you know, Roma is going to uh, have a significant saving in the, in the water uh, for Nebraska alone, we're going to save one uh, billion cubic meter of water and about uh, 34 million gallon for this uh, fuel. The project has uh, going on, this guy is same thing. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to finish. I mean, the project has been going on uh, for two years and we have some prototyping uh, currently in Nebraska, uh, it's going to uh, test. And as a system, you know, we implement the water smart irrigation decision, uh, making uh, sub infrastructure. And uh, as I see, this is a three year project, and uh, we are uh, uh, have one more year. And uh, I expect maybe we can uh, request for one, one more year non cost extension. But uh, currently, we have some prototype. Uh, available and uh, going to be testing in us and it is some. So, so basically I think, you know, the, the machine learning and the AI and, uh, uh, and the, the, the big data and uh, combined with uh, the high performance computing, we uh, change the agricultural landscape and uh, make uh, fully automated uh, uh, farming possible. And uh, we will see the, such kind of operation or prototyping within uh, 10 to 15 years. All right, Amy. You said, uh, yeah, this is the one. You said 2020? Uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Amy Barchowskis. I'm a data engineer um, at Development Seed. Uh, I'm going to be representing the work of our machine learning team here today. Uh, so I have their names listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, I'm going to be talking about geospatial machine learning for social good at large scale. So some of the projects that we've worked on um, to advance humanitarian concerns, uh, specifically with UNICEF and the World Bank. So um, as a means of moving forward, uh, I'm going to just provide a brief outline of where we're going today. So talking about why AI, challenges of AI in production, you know, deploying a machine learning model on the cloud, uh, applications, and, and then finally applications and challenges for AI for social good. So uh, as we all are familiar, we're getting more and more satellite data every day and every year, huge spike. You see at the right hand side of that plot there, everybody has seen a version of this plot probably a hundred times just today. Um, so why is this a problem? Well, it's more data than we can handle. And the point of us all being in this room is that advances in AI and machine learning can help us actually take advantage of this massive amount of data. So um, what does a production ready machine learning pipeline look like? Uh, so Rahul sort of alluded to this earlier, but basically, um, you know, the ML code the model is really just a small piece of this picture highlighted in red here. You have the ML code um, and then you have all this stuff around it, all the stuff you have to do before in terms of data collection, data verification. And then finally, at the other end, you have your serving infrastructure when you're actually doing inference. You have to um, have all the mo monitoring and robustness of that type of infrastructure. Um, you know, as a data engineer, this diagram makes me pretty happy because it's all it's all the stuff that I work on around it and my team works on around it um, that is also highlighted here. In addition to the machine um, the machine learning training and classification and uh, production code. So again, this is another picture of uh, basically how complex this actually is. So you might start planning and think your pipeline's gonna look like this. In the best case, you have a couple loops. 
in the average case, you actually, uh, you don't just have, you know, you don't just have one loop that's going around. You basically have all of these messy loops where you're iterating at different parts of the pipeline. Um, so what makes, what makes ML hard? Well, there's many factors. There's the difficulty of the problem. Pixel-wise, image segmentation is more difficult than image classification. Uh, the quantity and quality of the training data and the desired performance and reliability of the deployed model. It might be in lots of cases we've seen that actually having a very high accuracy is not as important as just having a good signal, which you can use to basically build a tool that people will use for verification. Uh, so to reiterate this point, we have a data team where their real expertise is just creating high quality training data. So this is a team of of people that are basically using tools and satellite imagery to create high quality training data. So doing things like um, identifying windows on buildings. So um, that's all about the, you know, why AI, why AI and some of the reasons why AI in production is hard. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some of the use cases. So uh, the first one is UNICEF school mapping. So um, a bit, of motivation to get started, which is uh, which is all about basically UNICEF's vision for um, mapping and connecting every school on Earth. So this is a page from um, UNICEF.org about their school mapping initiative, and it goes into more detail. But basically, it, it does showcase this tool, which is the first step. This tool of basically mapping every school in developing countries and across the globe. Um, and the motivations for doing so, uh, those being to understand, it, understand how connectivity affects learning outcomes, to plan for better infrastructure, to build connectivity in these schools, emergency response, and also providing a platform for collaboration. So this is the first step in providing platforms for local communities to collaborate on this problem. Um, and it's an additional sort of metric on the motivation behind this, uh, by um, 2030 on this page, it, it details how by 2030, there will be 60 million uh, children across the globe without access to primary education and UNICEF is trying to fix this problem. So um, this is uh, one of the countries that we work in is Colombia. And I'm not sure how well you can see in this picture, but there starts to be some basically annotation of these images around schools and you start to see why the problem of mapping schools is so challenging is because of the heterogeneous nature, just by, even if you can't see the annotations, you can kind of see by looking at these pictures that nothing really looks very uniform. It's very hard for us to basically design a pattern around these images. So why, why is this? So schools are unlike any other building infrastructures. They have a primary purpose, but also function as spaces for public gathering, recreation, shelter, and polling stations. Therefore, schools have many unique features that other buildings don't have in the community. From overhead imagery, they can show different shapes, such as U, O, I, H shapes. They might have a basketball, a playground, a swimming pool, um, but you might may have a cluster of buildings that have the same roof color, or the build, and you might notice that building sizes are bigger compared to surrounding buildings. So this is just to bring up that picture again, in case you can see the annotations, you see that there's this O shape on the very left-hand side, some U shapes, um, et cetera. So this is the infrastructure that we built um, for, the, uh, for this classification problem of identifying schools. Um, and one of the things to highlight here is basically you see that there's professional mappers at each step of this process. So we have professional mappers at the beginning, basically creating our high, um, our high quality training set though that training sets being fed into our model, um, which is being trained with a, a, a library called Exception, that's a convolutional neural network. Um, that's basically being served on our model inference infrastructure to create predictions of what tiles actually have schools in them that are, um, and those, those outputs, those output predictions, so probability of a school being in a particular satellite imagery tile, um, those are also annotated by professional mappers. They basically look and say, oh, this is, here's the school, here isn't the school, and then they identify false positives. 
Um, so this is the output. Basically, we uh, for Columbia that produced 7,000 unmapped schools on top of the known schools. Uh, how did we get there? So we started with 45,000 raw um, school data from the UNICEF team. We narrowed that down to 10,000 schools with very, very clear school features. Uh, developed an algorithm which makes a judgment whether an image contains a school or not. Uh, to train this algorithm, we use 7,000 schools and 5,000 not school images uh, and validate that algorithm. Out of 200 trained models, we selected the best model and fed uh, 52 million tiles that cover Colombia and 11 East Caribbean nations. Our model predicted 60,000 image tiles contain schools. And then our data team finally confirmed 12,000 of them um, contain school buildings with clear school building image features mentioned in the last slide. So 7,000 of these schools are new schools that have not yet been added to the map. Uh, so looking forward, um, we want to refine this MM model for 11 different building classes and take advantage of um, some new technologies such as TensorFlow 2.0, Kubeflow, and Cabot for model training, um, and then use some tools such as Chip and Scale, which is an internal tool that we built that develop and see for model inference. Uh, so the next use case is um, housing passports, which is a World Bank initiative. Uh, so motivation here, so um, it's basically all around uh, poor housing, you know, poor housing infrastructure, and the World Bank's initiative to retrofit houses, which basically so. Housing tends to be a family's one asset, only asset, their um, most important asset, and an important piece of them being able to basically uh, have collateral for loans and have a home base for finding work. And further, unsafe housing can be life-threatening when disasters strike. More than 1.3 million people worldwide have died in disasters caused by natural hazards in the last 25 years. And World Bank would like to help with this effort by figuring out which houses could benefit and which neighborhoods could be benefit from retrofitting um, as a cost fast effective as a fast cost effective uh, way to save these lives. And uh, this is taken from the World Bank blog um, on housing passports, uh, which um, can provide more insight. This is an interest a topic of interest to you. Um, so to understand why this is a problem the UN has identified, it helps to little, know a little bit more about the economics. So often cities um, offer more opportunities as far as jobs and resources than people's local, uh, rural local communities. So families um, maybe in these rural er areas looking to make a better life, they'll search for higher paying jobs in cities. Unfortunately, when they get there, they might be priced out of the formal housing market and end up in cheaper neighborhoods that are often cheaper because the houses are not up to code. Um, buildings may be built on risky land, prone to, national, prone to natural disasters. So the World Bank is working to retrofit these areas. Uh, so they're working on this global program for resilient housing. And um, this used to take months, dozens of staff and a big budget to basically identify these houses that needed to be retrofit for the next disaster. But thanks to recent advances in machine learning, homes that need to be strengthened can be mapped with just three things, a car mounted camera, a drone and a laptop. And that's what we worked with. Um, so the resulting program is called this housing passports, which provides um, provides information about each home. So this is a little uh, animation of how this works. So a uh, car mounted drone, um, a, a, a drone mounted on a car is driving by this house. And as it goes, it's basically identifying, it's um, identifying if it's painted or not painted with a certain amount of confidence. Um, basically these um, images that the uh, that this drone is collecting is resulting in this passport. So you can see on the right hand side all the information that's being gathered and provided back in this tool. Um, so things to notice here are things like the number of floors, the approximated size and volume. Um, there's a construction ML which says the construction is complete. There's a design um, model that's basically saying this is a design versus um, you'll see in a second a uh, like a, a thing that looks a little bit more like a shaft would be classified as not designed um, and then there'd be like painted versus not painted 
and then a risk assessment. Um, so we applied this in a few different countries using 675,000 street view images um, and six, 6 million building parts and properties were detected and added to the database. Building parts include doors, windows, garages. Building properties have materials, material types, security, construction types, and vantage. So looking forward, um, we have a proof of concept called Housing Passports Mobile that brings inference to the field. And some key takeaways. Um, the key challenge here is variation and heterogeneous nature of the world makes robust ML models hard, especially in developing economies. And a key solution is high quality training data produced by high resolution satellite imagery and expert human mappers. So thanks. Thank you, Amy. Yuhan? First one. Thanks, Amy. Hello, everyone. I'm Yuhan Rao from North Carolina State University, also North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies, co located with NCEI in Asheville, North Carolina. And today's presentation will be uh, largely uh, my work from the dissertation and some uh, discussion that I had with my colleagues in uh, NCAX in Asheville. Uh, so today we'll be focusing on the, how we can use machine learning models to improve the quality of the surface air temperature data over the station sparse regions. And two case study that I had here is one is called Tibetan Plateau or the, um, uh, in China and the other one would be Northern High Latitude over 60 degree north, which we have also have really sparse region uh, station coverage. And then the last part to close out will be the challenges of appropriate uh, machine learning applications using Earth's uh, observations and environmental data. Oops. So here, just uh, uh, showing a map of the station measurements of temperature over the global land surface on the lab bottom figure here, we can see most of stations are highly clustered over the North America and the Europe and for the regions like Africa and South America, especially over the Amazon, we don't have much stations. When we move to the polar regions and high mountain regions, uh, the uh, density of the stations are quite sparse. And when we're looking at the uh, uncertainty of using those station-based uh, surface air temperature data sets, we, uh, this uh, top left map showing the uncertainty, the, the warmer the color is, the larger the uncertainty is over the past um, 40 years. And we can see that there's a uh, large spatial correlation between the uh, spa uh, station density with the uh, uncertainty of the data analysis. And so here, just using, I present this result before in our machine learning class uh, presentation, which shows that when we are grouping those uh, surface area based on a five, by, five degree by five degree box, and for the regions, we only have one station, the uh, uncertainty of the trend analysis in the past 40 years are quite large compared to the, uh, compared to the regions we have really dense station uh, um, measurements like in the North America and uh, in the Europe. And for the two cases, one is the Tibetan Plateau. We all know that because of the high elevation, it's really hard to set up the station measurements over the uh, land surface over high mountain regions. And this is the background color is the elevation over the Tibetan Plateau. And then we can see over the western part of the plateau, the high elevation means that we only have one or two stations over there. When we're trying to analyze the um, temperature change in the past 40 years, that can lead to large uncertainty when we lack this uh, type of uh, measurements. And uh, on the right side, just showing the downward shifting from the overall stage, uh, overall elevation of the Tibetan Plateau and the station covered region, uh, the elevation of the station covered region. So we highly uh, bias towards the lower elevation over the plateaus. And with the satellite, the Earth observations that we can use some uh, satellite products to estimate social temperature um, with the help from some ground measurements to train our model. 
So here just showing the highly correlation between the surface cell temperature and the length surface temperature, which can be observed from the satellites. And so we trained an all sky model using machine learning model. Uh, this is the uh, training and validation result that we can see the result are quite promising when we're training our model with the uh, daily surface station measurements with the satellite observations that with a near a zero bias and relatively small RMSC for this model. And so when we apply it to the uh, larger scale of the regions that we can, uh, this the top left is our model performance. And then on the, the other three panels are existing data sets. Some of the data sets have really core spatial resolutions that can lose a lot of spatial details when we're doing more localized uh, temperature, the climate change analysis. So when we analyzing the, uh, the overall temperature change over the dependent metal, and then the green line is the uh, estimation from our uh, machine learning based data, and then red lines from the station measurements from the surface, that we can see the satellite based machine learning derived surface air temperature shows a higher warming rates over the dependent metal. When we're looking at the spatial details, which um, over the left, uh, over the western part of the plateau, that where there's no spatial measurements, we see a really high warming rate, which are neglected by the station measurement network. So this can lead to a problem when we're doing a local and regional uh, climate change analysis. So that's the uh, case study over the plateau. And then further on, I move on to the northern high latitudes, not physically, but the study ever moved to the northern high latitudes. So when we're looking at the global uh, GHC and daily data set, which is data set for, uh, maintained by NOAA, that we have uh, quite good representation of the stations, but only for certain regions. Like for Alaska, we have quite good representation. But when we look at Greenland and some regions in the uh, north, uh, in the uh, close to the Arctic Circle, that we do not have much stations over there. So it's really hard to tell what, uh, what's the uncertainty of the uh, climate analysis using the station best measurements. So, and we follow on the uh, previous success on using over the dependent metal, then we uh, further train the machine learning model over the northern high latitude. The, uh, this is the performance of our model that we can see the performance of this model becomes a little bit uh, worse than the performance we see over the dependent plateau because this more uh, the region we can see that for the permanent solar and ice surface we have no not much training data so this goes back to the quality of the training data and without a good representation of the training data that can lead to a larger uncertainty of the model that you train itself but when we apply this uh, data to the um, to the larger region of the northern high latitude, about 60 degrees north, we can get, get a quite detailed representation of the surface temperature uh, conditions in the past, uh, in the past uh, for, uh, for, de for decades. And we can see the detail much clearer than the uh, model and other interpolated data sets. And those are two applications of machine learning model on earth estimating surface air temperature. And, but I want to draw more attention to the uncertainty side of machine learning, which are uh, usually when you're looking at publications that people tend to pay less attention to it because for the publication, you always want to show the best results. But when you're looking at into the details of machine learning applications, that here is a result from our dependent plateau study where we did the lean one station out um, cross relation, we have about 130 stations. So we trained the model 130 different times by lapping one station, by leaving one station out and to test the model performance over that, that one station that had been left out. So we can see if you're, um, so for some station that performed really, uh, the performance is quite, uh, bad compared to other parts. So some stations are RMSC can be as large as three degrees. So when we're looking at uh, climate signals, the three degree can completely overwhelm the signal that you might see from the data. So this um, leads to the uh, problem of the quality of your training data. Can your data be representative of your, of your um, overall uh, signal that you want to study? 
So here we further did a 25-fold cross-validation analysis where we separate all the stations into 25 different folds and using 24 folds to train data and then train the model and then validate the model over uh, one um, fold that is left out from the stations. And for some uh, cross-validation results, we see the performance are quite, um, there's some room to improve. So um, this is just a scatter plot to test the scatter plot that of this um, specific set as an example. But when we dig into further details of the set of model, that for the training set, set data set and the validation data set, we can see a complex uh, distribution shift. So which means we're training a model based on a one set of uh, data, but applying this model to a completely different data set with different mean value, different standardization. So this can lead to large problems. This is just another way to represent the distribution differences over the training and the validation data sets. Okay. Yeah, and another thing that a machine learning model can, uh, can be quite uh, challenging to um, manages the model, complex, uh, model complexity, especially for the deep learning. This one is just like regular machine learning model. And when we are changing different hyperparameters, the model performance can vary quite um, much when we're uh, using much more complicated uh, hyperparameter combinations. But sometimes when you're increasing your model complexity, it not necessarily improve your model performance. And so there's always a trade-off of how, what's your acceptable uh, performance of the model and what's the uh, computing resource you have to uh, improve the model performance. So with the increase in model complexity, sometimes it's not necessarily meaning that you will achieve better model results. Another one is, like people are always talking about the overfitting issue with machine learning model, that was uh, the top, uh, the, red, uh, the red dot here representing the model performance in the training process. And then the um, blue dots here means the cross cross validation set. So when we're looking at the model training, that you see quite stable performance across different sets. But when you are uh, applying this uh, model to different data sets, you can see the performance varies quite significantly. It can be as large as 0 0.6 degrees for a temperature estimation. This can completely overhaul the signals that you might see on your data set, as well as for the RMSC that can, uh, if you do not um, carefully design a model form a uh, model training that the RMSC can even double when you're do, uh, you doing your prediction and estimation. So I want to end my presentation with one of the my favorite birds that I'm a brother. So this is a cross field bird that I just want to use this as example from the evolutionary theory that this bird is they develop a cross field try to fix their um, the feeding pattern because the, the nuts they are using, or they're eating uh, require specific shape of the field. So in order to open this type of uh, food for them to survive. So the same thing with the cross field. The cross field, you can see when you look going to different mountains because the nuts shape are different, you can see a significant difference from their uh, field shape. And so for the machine learning models, it's the same thing that when we are applying even the same model structure to different regions or to uh, different scales that if we do not design our model or train our model uh, uh, carefully or into, in response to specific situations, that model performance can be unpredictable, especially the data uncertainty. So to uh, conclude my part with two minutes left. And so the first, uh, um, conclusion is that machine learning can be used to integrate set of observations with the in situ measurements to improve the quality of the temperature, temperature data sets and for the further climate analysis. But the proper deployment of machine learning requires careful design that has been touched by previous speakers, by Rob and by other people as well. That there is a teamwork, it's not just that a domain, uh, one person work to do the model and try to apply it to across scales. That will be all for my presentation.
All right, our last speaker in this session is uh, Jensen Sun, and then afterwards I'd ask that uh, people could ask questions of any of our speakers. So are we doing this one? Is it this one? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jensen from John Mason University. And my um, presentation is Joe Weaver. Um, I think I want to um, consider that as a new AR workflow management system and to address the problems that mentioned by our previous speakers. Um, so I, I want to I want to um, overview the the talk of our previous speakers. So um, who mentioned uh, the the review of the existing machine learning uh, researchers and uh, talk about the the focus area we should uh, uh, we should think about in the in the next uh, decades and uh, we can talk about the the very bright future of the agriculture and um, man farming that is uh, very very um, I think very significant for our economy and society and Amy Amy did a very excellent job on the um what bank projects i think um a lot of projects they did for um uh, using uh, using the machine learning to develop all kinds of uh ability stuff um like uh, the the very high resolution image recognition and uh yuhan also used the machine learning in their um, net cover i think uh, in the tv data processing so um I want to say there is many, many more uh, researchers using machine learning, and I can, I can, I think everyone here agrees that uh, sooner, or not, sooner or later the, the fire of AR will, will burn in the uh, science domain. But do not see that in Australia. Um, that, that's yeah. Um, so, um, but 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 the progress is not that slow. Because we didn't see any breakthroughs in the science in the recent years. It's not like in the computer science. Uh, every year they will have some breakthrough uh, using the AI to solve the real problems. We haven't heard about the operational use of technology you know, in the at least in the industry um, right now. At least not me. Uh, I don't know what everybody uh, think about that. Um, so the major AI game, game changer is like uh, um, there is a lot of low cost sensor and we have a lot of data available and we have deep learning, reinforced learning and all, all these uh, techniques uh, available and we have all the cloud, uh, even cluster uh, computing sources and we have workflow automation but why my AI model not working? After all, I think that a lot of people have the same experiences as I have. At least Amy mentioned her experiences about using the machine learning and a lot of things there. Um, so you can see the, the model in computer vision science. The left one was uh, amazingly smooth, but uh, when we use that in our science domain, it, it will fail. Trust me, it will fail. Uh, maybe the first uh, 1,000 times. Um, so what, what goes wrong? We have all the same routine. We we'll have all the same resources here. Uh, why AI model not working in the earth science? I consider this question as the apple tree question in AI domain. Um, just as the apple tree question is a foundation question of the physics. So this question, we have to answer that to solve the real problem in Using AI, how to use AI to improve the sign. Um, so this is my initial understanding. So there is boundaries of the AI model. It's not like you train the one model, you can use it everywhere. No, that, that's not that's not how it works. Um, there is a boundary uh, of its application. So we have to we have to define where it can be used. And another uh, problem is big data is a very big problem. So we have to, uh, you know, so I, I drafted this, uh, this robot here. So if we tell this robot, this is a tree, 
and he will know this is chain. But we give it a chain like this one, he 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 will you know, he, he doesn't recognize it. He cannot recognize it. So why is that? Why why our um, you know human being can recognize this uh, very uh, very easily, but why machine cannot do that? So um, machine cannot deductive learning. That's uh, that's why. Um, there is another limitations of the existing neural network or whatever machine learning models. We have to address that problem by you know um, by big data because we have to feed both chains to the Java to to this uh, machine to let it know um, both of them. Oh, sorry, both of them are chains. So then the he will recognize both chains in any uh, situations. So the training data set is essential, just as Amy said. And uh, for the Earth science, there is another spatial um, requirement, spatial temporal data. It will result in very high complexity. And uh, there is too many possibilities, uh, way many possibilities, uh, even more than the computer science. So that's also another reason why the model is not working in our domain. So from the engineering perspective, that's another very important thing because we do not have a very huge group researching on this thing, just like Google or Amazon. We do not have that kind of uh, group teams. We only have probably maybe 10 um, people working together as a team. Um, so, so we have to analyze what the, fun, uh, what the bottlenecks is. Um, so I conclude this several key bottlenecks, um, like the time-consuming data for processing. As, as many of you know that a lot of data is existing in different formats uh, in a science domain. We have to transform them into machine learning ready format. That is, uh, takes the most significant amount of time, like 60% of the whole time is spent on that one. Um, and also, we also spend uh, too much time on sorting out resources because um, when the resources are um, beyond our control, we will, you know, exhaustive to manage them. That's a very big problem. And uh, uh, we we have we run numerous uh, field attacks and the uh, hyperparameter, which is the only parameter we can control in our machine learning model. Uh, if you want to turn them to the optimal uh, op optimal status, that takes a long time to do that. And also lack of training levels, and the AI model uncertainty is also a reason. And uh, AI only learns, they don't understand what they're doing. So that's a, that's a limit of the whole AI theory right now. Um, so AI needs very careful engineering um, to make it work in your science. And uh, it requires a lot of effort, uh, very expensive. And like uh, the Tesla's autopilot, it costs a uh, way expensive money. And that is uh, that's the reason. And uh, um, we need a huge training data set. So um, we want to know exactly um, how to engineer an AI model in the science. So we have to um, uh, answer this question, how much workload to train an AI, AI model, uh, how many people are, are required and uh, can AI work in solo, and, like one person can do that? Um, Amy said, she don't think so. <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe in future sometime it can be done. So um, this is the size of uh, equations. A lot of people told me that to not put um, equations in slides, but I promise this is the only one. Um, we have to, we have to, to I created this equations uh, to understand what uh, caused this, uh, this heavy AI workload. So the overall AI workload, uh, WAI equals uh, A multiple uh, WP, WP is person workload uh, plus uh, this workload of the machine. So it's, uh, it's divided into two parts. The person workload and the machine workload. Uh, the person workload is defined by um, the pre-processing time uh, multiplied by number of classes you want to classify. If that is classified classification, 
uh, problem. Plus, um, TTP, TTW is a chain test validation time. Um, multiple OAI is a complexity of AI algorithm and the number of hyper parameters and the distribution of probability, probability distribution of the sampling um, data set. If that distribution, distribution is normal, it will take way less time to change that. Um, and also it uh, is a um, post processing because we have to translate the result of AI model into something that is meaningful. Uh, that takes time. And uh, the number of classes and the tools used in the whole uh, workflow. If the tools, if you use like dozens of tools, the whole workflow will take a long time. And uh, multiple by the number of samples. It's divided by AW. So um, AW is uh, how uh, is the ultimate automatic level of your workflow. So if that workflow is automated by uh, by tools, then the person workload will be way uh, way much less. And this is machine uh, machine work, work, uh, workload. I don't want to go into this one question. Uh, it's similar, but it's uh, you know machine is different from human. And we if at this point, we mostly focus on this uh, person workload. If we want to make AI engineering easier, we have to reduce this AI workload significantly in the uh, assignment. So this equation, I think it's very essential and uh, very mandatory to start uh, before we really dive into that AI training uh, process. And Amy said a similar thing because uh, the training, the machine learning process is a is a circle. It's not like a one one time thing. It's a it's back and forth. You have to change the model back and forth many times. It's like uh, uh, this work, workload is like one person working on that model. The machine is resting. And if the if you run that model to start to change, the person will have less workload. In the machine will you know, have, um, uh, is running intensively to change that model. So it's like this circles, um, circles, it's like circles until the model is well trained. So this is the AI engineering curve. Um, and after analyzing the equations, we analyzed, the, we concluded four urgent um, barriers blocking our attempt. So, um, so I don't think we have time to go through this one, uh, and and this this could this could change if uh, if the existing deep learning schema is changed by the big players in the field like uh, Stanford, MIT, and Google. If they change the algorithm, probably these uh, barriers will be gone and the new barriers will come up. But right now we have to we have to face them. Um, so the the unsatisfied needs of the last decade is. Um, I don't know, maybe Amy has the same experience with me. Uh, I'm tired of to interact with all these platforms. The CoLab, the Google Earth Engine, the Amazon Web Services, Jupyter Notebook, TensorFlow. I am tired. Um, <laughs> and I'm, okay, I'm, I'm busy every day, so I, I did found some solutions. Um, to, to, help, to help me to cope with them. To, um, to be standing in the middle of them, to shield all these things away from me. So it, it has to be a modular uh, management system that can, you know, deal with, to communicate with all these platforms and help me to organize the experiment. So I would be happy. Um, I'm trying to do that. So Jailweaver is our solution to, to meet that. And at least for me, this is an amazing uh, tool. Uh, it's an open source MIT tool, and uh, it has very comfortable use user interface because the Windows style, the dialogue style is uh, is Mac Mac style. So it feels like you are using your Mac in the web browser. So this is uh, the demo of the Jailweaver. Um, so now I opening um, the the file system of this remote server, and I put it aside. Then I start to run my deep learning uh, code in Python. Uh, first, uh, I made some changes in the Python code. 
because I don't want the um, the bug is too um, is too many to um, yeah I come out of this sentence and uh, I start to run it on some some server because uh, this is uh, the code and server is separated so I have to choose which server to run this uh, code every time if you want don't want to choose every time you can you can say save this uh, collection then it don't ask at the end so it's running. So uh, this is running the this uh, the, the model is already changed. I changed the model to save time. Um, I can use this for to change the model as well. The one feature of JWaver is you can check every execution's history. So every execution you will you will have something recorded. So uh, after a while your your code doesn't work, you will see why it works. It doesn't work. You can check the history of this execution. So now it's it's finished. I can click the file system uh, file data here to view the results. And this is for the um, ag agriculture net cover classification. So we uh, we poke around the, the existing market of the workflow management system, and none of them can meet our requirements. The Geoweaver is the only one. <laughs> Um, maybe that's uh, that. Maybe um, maybe that's not because I'm the developer. Um, so it divides all the resources into three levels. The first level is host. It's uh, like Amazon services, uh, uh, Google Earth Engine, like uh, um, your private servers and your laptops. And uh, the second level is process. It's like your uh, Jupyter notebook, Python. Python code, the R um, shell script, and the high level is a workflow. You can link all these processes together. So its features in like, uh, uh, it could be Wiki and FTP, SSH, IDB, anyway, all of them. Uh, maybe some is uh, the two features. I, I don't think so. I think uh, we are standing on the shoulder of the giants. So. We are we are not doing it from scratch. We, we are using all kinds of libraries. So it is doable, and it can meet our our needs. Like uh, um, these platforms are reusing the legacy prog programs and automate the workflows. So it has several benefits, and uh, I think I don't even have time. So most of the benefit is save not save money. <laughs> Uh, you can reuse your existing servers, not discarding them and uh, buy the uh, buy very expensive Amazon resources. And uh, you can reuse some existing resources in your institution. And uh, it's a producible workflow. Um, my vision of this uh, GeoWeaver managed AI is uh, it will make AI and engineering very efficient. So we have less workload to make uh, the AI model really, really work uh, in Earth science. So this is our support sources, the UC lab, the, the NSF, Earthcube, CyberCaster, we got some code from there, and the SGI and AGO. So that's it, thank you. I don't know about you, but I feel Jensen's cold glass of AI water at the beginning of his talk is a nice kind of, uh, a lot of times when you come to these sessions that AI is going to save the world, but I think I actually really appreciate the, let's see what uh, our kind of machine learning and AI experts are really going through and the challenges that they have and that uh, people are coming up with solutions to uh, help mitigate those challenges. So we only have a few minutes left in the session, but I ask if anyone has any questions for any of our speakers that you heard from today. Yeah, please. Actually, I think I have two questions. Um, the first is for Ping. Um, and this is more about, this is more about maybe a psychological or sociological question for the farmers. But do you find the farmers are accepting of the use of AI? I mean, I can see maybe you know, we think that the corporate farms, the food farms, would be would be embracing. But how about the individual farms? Are they? It is a you know, one of the research talks that we, of course, you know, we are about the farmers. It's 
the intent of the society and uh, was not found together. Because a lot of people think that this will cause the job loss at the end. And uh, by the way, if you believe this is inevitable, you know, not even the history of the uh, party, you know, that in the uh, 19th century, the US had about 60 percent of people who are not the only people. Yeah, and this, uh, I think it's uh, inevitable people come to the end of life. And uh, so, you know, maybe you we can train the next generation of uh, you know, uh, uh, people from rural areas working in the world to help, uh, you know, and if I may have one other question, is, was it Amy? So, yeah, so I can, so there was one slide, I'm not sure if I fully understood, but it was identifying the schools in Columbia, and um, I thought I saw that the, uh, there were 60,000 schools that, that were uh, that were identified, and out of the 60,000 schools, there were 12K,